is uh, something that just surprised the whole world. It's a big challenge to the existence of Europe and to the history of Europe. The only war we are at at this moment is the war against the pandemics. Decretar el estado de alarma en toda España. But we will continue to do everything. afternoon or evening depending on where you base right now first of all i want to thank you all the participants in this session who have joined this project despite these tough and challenging times we are living all over the world and of course also in the travel industry but before introducing our today's speakers let me introduce forward it's an international community and a space for debate to share knowledge new ideas and new businesses but above all to try to find answers to the most urgent and questions of our crisis. And these urgent questions around the industry right now are related to COVID crisis. What, be, what will be the experience of tomorrow like? What shall we understand of luxury travel? The answers, of course, are not simple. But this is exactly the reason to be here today with the brightest minds in travel marketing. Uh, please welcome Robert Cole, founder and CEO of Rocket Cheetah, and also serves as Focus Right Senior Research Analyst for Locking and Laser Travel and a Senior Consultant to GD Power. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Brandon Majors, Chief Revenue Officer at ERA, with over 15 years of experience in travel and data drive and marketing. Brandon expertly advised travel companies on how to leverage marketing technology to grow their business. Prior to joining Adara, Brandon held a senior marketing, sales and partnerships roles at some of the world's largest ODAs and travel companies, including Orbitz and Hotwire. Brandon holds a Bachelor of Business Administration degree from Grand Valley State University. Welcome on board, Brandon. And uh, Mercedes Blanco, Vice President of Sales in the Americas, BCB Travel, uh, sorry, BCB uh, Rate Game Company. She's certified digital marketing from Harvard IEA Business School alumni and uh, executive leader in travel and hospitality, leader international sales and marketing strategies for over 15 years. Her passion and love for travel is seen through her dedication and positive thinking in the workplace. Mercedes, welcome on board and uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. And Brandon, Robert, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to get to know you, at least virtually. I think that um, one of the things that I'm loving the most about COVID-19 is how we are embracing the digital landscape. We've been talking about digital transformation for years, but still we were hesitant about what digital transformation meant, right? And uh, we are now um, with no other choice than embracing those digital landscapes. So thank you so much for joining me today. And as uh, Fabian mentioned before me, we are gonna try to keep this uh, very open to conversation very um, um, very unique because I think that all of us, we've been joining a lot of webinars lately and we might be tired of the same content all over and over again, right? But um, I will be doing my very best to try to keep this uh, relevant for yourselves and, and for the audience. Um, obviously, we all know that we are facing unprecedented times. Uh, my company, your company, Brandon, like any other tech travel companies in the world, we've been having to implement a lot of um, hard measures, hard breaking measures. We had to uh, lay off people, put people on for law, but uh, the travel industry is resilient. And I am sure, and I am hopeful that we will survive this, this upcoming ch uh, uh, challenging times, right? Um, however, I wanna try to be very positive. I like to define me positive by nature. So let's talk about all the positive things that um, 
we are facing and I try to even if we can give a little bit of advice to our colleagues and, and peers in the industry in your opinion what do you think that um the travel companies are doing to survive yeah, I, th I think what um, is very encouraging is the amount of collaboration happening right now um, particularly around data um, what we're seeing is there's a huge demand and a huge interest for information um, and the information isn't necessarily looking backwards or even looking at right now, but everyone really want, wants to understand you know, better where the turnaround is, right? Can I predict, is it three months out? Is it six months out? You know, what's that real kind of inflection point? I think the challenge is, is that travel, at least in the short term, is going to be constrained by capacity, right? Whether that's air capacity, hotel capacity, folks aren't working they're not manning the stations and so you know the constraint is um, capacity but then it's also confidence um, and so those are the two things that we're really trying to get a gauge on and one of them you know the uh, the capacity part that's a number it's something that you can you know really measure um, the confidence one is a little bit more elusive um, you know right now there's no confidence i don't want to walk outside my front door but then, you know, what what are the degrees of confidence? I, I do anticipate at a certain point, folks will feel comfortable getting in their car and maybe driving 100 miles for some sort of experience. But then that next step on getting in an airplane or getting in an Uber, where I don't know who sat in that seat before me, you know, that's going to be the real the real measure that we all got to kind of look for is when people have the confidence to start to engage and start to be humans again. I think that's the real point of change that we all are looking for. And right now, unfortunately, it's you know unknown, um, but I am hopeful and optimistic that we'll get there um, in a relatively you know reasonable time frame. No, no, yeah, I completely agree. It's it's a big unknown. We're working on some things at Focusrite um, to do some really hard stuff on looking forward and trying to be very database to to say what are the signals that are really going to start indicating a, a turnaround things like that so um and unfortunately you have to do it specifically yeah you know, certainly country by country and, and certainly city by city even so our first one um actually it's not uh, as we're recording this it isn't really published yet um but it's new york city and the forecasts that we've come up with for april and may are around 12 percent occupancy right for the hotels or sp we're specifically looking at hotels and in this case, and a good chunk of that occupancy would be for essential medical workers and you know, essential jobs that have to be in the city. Um, right now, we're looking at June being um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 38%, which based on 12% is a tremendous turnaround, but in the, you know, empirically from uh, what the hotels are um, normally used to, I mean, New York normally was would be expected to run 88% occupancy. Um, sort of thing. So tremendous, tremendous hit, hit there. So um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to look, um, as Brandon said, on on the supply side. Um, there are hoteliers who are who are saying, yes, we're yeah, we're keeping our staffs in place, we're maintaining things, we're now open, we're pro providing rooms complimentary for medical workers, things like that, which is great. But the longer this drags, you know, this drags on. Um, that it just winds up becoming a cash flow issue, that sort of thing, which uh, which becomes tough. So, um, yeah, we'll have to see how that uh, how that goes because of the work we've been doing for when does the when does the virus let us do this? Um, that's that's the organism that is a uh, if you can even call it an organism that's really dictating the timeline, right? And uh, and then our behaviors with it, how we behave now in terms of social distancing, things like that. Um, certain areas of the U.S. aren't still even taking it quite seriously because they haven't really had any in their community. So um, so we'll have to see, and that's going to wind up extending uh, extending some of these. So yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question, but the fear of coming back, the financial capability of individuals to, to have the resources, again, depending on how long it, how long it lasts, um, will be a, will be challenging. So we're looking at it being local, as Brandon said, then kind of spread out regionally and, we're thinking the the air travel, and then certainly internationally, there may be a lot of um, a lot of governments who just say no, you are shut down as a country because of X, you know, whatever. Who knows what they'll they'll come up with? They may say you have to go to zero, you know, new cases for X period of time before we open up, or they may say no, that's fine, let's go, and and we'll just have to see how that uh, how that works out.
Trust me, I do understand that. I'm originally from Spain and just the difference alone uh, between the measures that we are taking here in the US and the measures that some countries like Italy and Spain are experiencing are devastating, right? But um, uh, the two of you have mentioned a couple of things that I believe are very important. One is data. Um, obviously, we've spent years talking about data, big data, digital transformation. Um, so my, I guess that my first question is, um, do you believe that companies are analyzing their first party data first, or are they turning to other partners to uh, try to help each other? Brandon, you mentioned unity. I, I've been seeing a lot of that movement as well. But um, how could we better predict a potential behavioral change among our customers in the, in the short term? Yeah, I think data sharing is important at this point um, because no one has a good view of what's happening right now. Um, and I think it's really important, as you mentioned, um, you know, previously, geographically, um, you know, inflection points will be different as well. But I think the other interesting thing that we're starting to see is that countries are um, having conversations around bilateral arrangements, right? Your security's up to snuff, my security's up to snuff. And so together we'll allow travel um, as partners and that we're opening up to the whole world. And so I do think data is gonna be pretty important, but I think you know, the sharing of data is something that is gonna really drive, you know, kind of movement going forward. Um, no one's gonna be able to make decisions in a silo and a vacuum. It's not about my own um, enterprise individually. It's not about United or Marriott. It's not about any individual brand. It's really about travel as a whole and coming together to create an environment in which there's confidence in travel more broadly. And I think that's gonna be kind of the requirement is that, you know, really, and we've all kind of operated in travel, we've all kind of you know, really understood the, the front of me term in a very intimate way in travel. And I think that's gonna become even more intimate um, here as, as we look to try to drive rebound. Um, and, and so that's that's kind of it in my mind. It's not necessarily about looking at my own first party data but who can I partner with to get a better view and a better understanding of what's happening more broadly? And how do I facilitate that on a global scale? Because travel is a global phenomenon. And I think that's the, the really important mindset that you know, marketers and brands have to have at large. Right, and, and certainly the airlines have very good data and, and really through a lot of their, their mechanisms of, of jointly owned you know, organizations, you have Air and, um, Oh, ARC and groups like that 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 share a lot of data. You know, it's it's basically subscribed and supported by their by the member airlines. That's very good. The hotel industry not quite is uh not quite as good. They they rely very much on groups like uh, STR for um for research. Now again, most of that is backward looking. What was the performance last you know last week and things like that, um, which is not a fault of STR. They do a great job and they have a large panel of hotels that provide that information. Um, but the forward-looking stuff is is difficult, and um, especially now with a lot of groups uh, they're laying off and uh, you know furloughing their employees, a lot of this um, data collection is is now starting to falter, right? Because they don't have the um, a lot of the detail at a lot of these um, at a lot of these properties um, or the staff corporately to to necessarily handle it. So um, I, I think the airline now the airlines are in a a, a very very challenging spot in terms of of people having the confidence to to get back on them. Um, maybe not quite as challenging as the cruise lines, um, but I, I just saw some stats uh, yesterday. The cruise lines, you know, bookings for 2021 are at record levels, right? But it's not necessarily that people are are wanting and eager to take a cruise. It's they had one booked this year that was canceled, and they're rescheduling for, you know, for an itinerary further, you know, further out. Um, but still, that's that's tricky. So I'm. I'm going to be very interested in seeing how the industry, particularly on the hospitality side, can pull together and get that information. Right now, the, um, even from a, a governmental perspective, um, they're trying to come up with databases of what hotels are open, what hotels are closed. I mean, airlines, very simple for schedules and things like that to know what's exactly happening. Um, but for hotels, it's it's you know, a free for all at this point. And there's not a central organization that's pulling together. What is that inventory? What's open? What's not? Yeah. So it's, no, yeah, I, I totally hear you, Robert. I live in a high rise building in, in Miami and I am seeing right now uh, one, two, three, four, five, seven cruise uh, ships uh, in front of me. And, and it's it's definitely 
impacting me because I, I've never seen the same boats um, for a longer time than a couple of days um, here in, in the Miami Bay. But um, um, obviously we know that uh, travel is going to change. It has changed as a matter of fact. Um, however, we do have sore memories, right? And I keep hearing things like, uh, when we go back to normal. I, I, I would yeah. like to rephrase that uh, or, or think um, if there will be a new normal coming out of this, right? I, I have no questions that we will go back at traveling, um, both uh, because we want to do so personally, especially after being locked down with our families, although we love them working and, and, and trying to balance uh, our lives with our kids is, is definitely challenging, right? Uh, but also our corporate world needs our corporate travel back. But um, my question is, um, Robert, you have a deep uh, analytic mind. Uh, do you think that we are building a new uh, demand without realizing? Um, yes and no. I think you have to look at the various sectors. Um, group travel, I think, is, is going to be a challenge, right? The meetings and conventions um, aspect of it, I think, is, is going to be tough. And there may be a new normal there where a lot of individuals are winding up you know, discovering, oh, we can do things on Zoom and not necessarily have to get together. And I think the more you get into larger trade shows and, and conferences, things like that, um, those, at least from what we've been looking at, um, may be the last, you know, kind of cohort to come to come back, especially because a lot of those are booked further in advance and normally have longer lead times and things like that. Um, but it's also interesting. So I, you know, mentioned um, I work with Focusrite. Um, the Focusrite conference is not inexpensive, right? It, it's about four thousand dollars for three days. Um, but Focusrite, a number of years ago, started streaming all of those sessions for free. All the center stage sessions you can get just by tuning in. But still, every year they've had record numbers because people want to meet face to face because of the kind of the caliber you've got CEOs running around and a lot of venture capital people, equity analysts, um, you know, startups, all that sort of thing. So they want to meet in person. So I, I don't think that's going to die out. Um, I think there won't be as many conferences like that. And, and the numbers of people attending um, will wind up getting cut down and things like that possibly. Um, so yeah, the group, group market, um, well, for those conventions, you then have kind of corporate. Um, a lot of these companies are going to be looking at it and everyone's getting used to essential workers only, right? That's what's running. Everybody's saying, you know, non-essential workers are furloughed and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of these you know, corporations are going to look at it and go, wait a second, those are non-essential. And if you're non-essential, we don't need it. Um, so that again will be travel. Do we really need to take that trip and to err on the side of being conservative and not sending people out? Um, maybe a kind of a prudent financial decision too. So that may be kind of a self-generating thing. So I think the corporate uh, stuff will be uh, will maybe be you know not maybe as long as the group, but next. But I think the leisure travel. Uh, People will want to start getting out and visit, just visiting friends and friends and relatives, maybe not being in their house, that sort of thing. Maybe, um, you know, going regionally, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, let's get out and, and see some things because we've been we've been locked up for so long. So um, even staycations within a within a city, depending on how this, you know, if it drags out for a while. Um, there are going to be very, very interesting dynamics. I mean, Germany's um, looking at this now where if you've if you've had um, COVID-19 and you know, you've know you cleared through and it's fine, they still have to do more work to un truly understand if you're immune, you're immune for how long, that sort of thing. But um, Germany is looking at, hey, you may get some sort of, I'm not sure if it's an ID tag or a bracelet or something like that saying, I'm fine, I'm not contagious, I can go back to work and things like that. So I'm not sure if there are going to be people who kind of can travel and then others who haven't had it, who might have to stay at home or can't work. So there are going to be some very, very interesting dynamics depending on how, how this happens. But I think the demand for leisure travel is is certainly going to be there. Um, the, the real question I have is, will people have the financial wherewithal um, to really, you know, to go do that? Um, so it, it may be, you know, more affluent individuals and individuals who've had, actually had COVID um, who are 
who are winding up being kind of the first ones who are able to uh, to go out. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, totally, Brandon, you do have a lot of data. Um, I am assuming that uh, all of us, we are thinking that domestic will uh, come back first, right? But that, what is the data that you are looking at telling us? Yeah, so, so really quick on the last uh, point. So I think there's some practical things that will change. Um, so you know, China had to deal with uh, SARS in a way that was much more profound than we had to, to in the West. Um, but I do think just kind of, uh, practically, some things have changed, right? The idea that you have a certain amount of surveillance within the airport, measuring your temperature as you enter the border, I think that's something that you can expect a lot more broadly across the world. I think the other thing that's just very stark and very real in, in people's face is just the notion that you, you may walk in, you know, go on public transportation or go through an airport with a mask on. Like, th those little things will change in a much more broad way across the world. Um, and I think just the relationship with um, um, human contact in general um, will change. You, you may have a second thought about putting you know, a certain food in your mouth or shaking someone's hand over time. And I do think the way that human beings interact in general um, will change in a way that we don't quite understand just yet. Um, and so those are some of the things just on a practical level that I think we should all look towards as you know, things that may change um, and certainly has helped China overcome um, you know, COVID right now in a much more quicker fashion. Just the fact that they have had to go through this already. You know, they, they did have to deal with SARS and that was a real thing for them where that was more of a headline and a soundbite for us in the West. And I did think, think they made some pretty practical changes that have stuck with them and that have you know, created a situation and an environment and infrastructure for them to um, you know, rebound, rebound or suppress this thing in a much more dramatic fashion than other parts of the world. Yeah, and it's interesting just to, to echo that. The, you have this continuum, which is really kind of personal liberty of, of doing whatever you'd like, right? And just saying, hey, this is my choice. And I'm independent versus kind of the security end. And, and it doesn't, it applies to technology, right? It's like, hey, I want a three character password of ABC. Wouldn't that be easy? Well, that's really bad security sort of thing. So you kind of have this convenience versus security. Um, take out, and that is going to be a very interesting dynamic going forward because I think it, people will be aware of this. I mean, this, this disease, you know, there are many diseases that are, are transmitted much more easily. Measles, the average person, if they get the measles, it gives it to 15 other people. And there's a vaccine which keeps that from spreading, which is, which is fantastic, right? Ebola, Ebola kills half the people who get it. Things that, you know, just horrible disease. So this, you know, is more, you know, it, it's more contagious and um, and certainly more deadly than say, you know, flus that kind of everyone, you know, everyone experience, which kill tens of thousands of people, you know, around around the world uh, annually. So it, it it is going to be different, I think, because it it's it's worse than this sort of flu. Um, and and how do people emotionally kind of deal with that? So yeah, I I would think for um, for certainly for the airports, I would think for hoteliers, um, they're going to wind up having having the sort of thing where yes, you take your temperature when you go in the building. Um, they need to get these kind of quick tests. I believe there's a you know five or fifteen minute test that's you know under develop. I think it's Abbott Abbott Laboratories or one of those groups has has one that's fairly quick. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to have to have those. I'm not sure if it's in you know. If it's a hotel by hotel basis, I'm not sure if it's a governmental basis um, requiring masks. Um, I don't know. Again, I, I was on the Queen Mary 2 um, cruise ship. We took a 15 day cruise around the Caribbean in 2008. So that was pre H1N1, um, mm -hmm. things like that. And so people weren't necessarily concerned about there had been problems um, on cruise ships. But instead of a little you know, Purell hand sanitizer automated um, sort of thing. They had staff and they were out there saying, you know, squeezing hand sanitizer and every before you went into everything, you know, into into meals, into, um, you know, events or shows and things like that. And at first people were like, oh, but the staff was aggressive. If somebody was trying to sneak through, oh, I just went through. It's like, I don't care. You, my job is to stop you and yeah. make sure you are going to, you know, this is going to happen. And now you can go in and rejoin your family at dinner, even if you just stepped out for a moment. Sorry. Um, so yeah. I think people will wind up and, and everyone at first, I think, was a little like, oh, 
And I think a lot of cruise lines, a lot of hoteliers, things like that are very concerned about, you know, don't remind the guests there's a problem. It's like, no, you know, if once they kind of figure it out, go, oh, this is a standard procedure. Great. Yeah. I, okay. That's fine. It's not inconveniencing me much. And it, if it's helping everybody, good, let's go. And they ignore it and just, or they don't ignore it. They do it. They don't pay much attention to it. And it's just part of the normal process. So I think there'll be some adaptation, things like that. And I think, yeah, people will be used to seeing others. Um, I just went to the grocery store this morning. I would say, and I live in Texas, which is a little bit more lax and easy going than some of the other places. Um, but I would say 80, 85% of the people in the store had masks on. So, um, yeah, fewer with gloves, but that's, you know, that's okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So I think people will be compliant and nobody seemed upset about it or anything like that. I mean, they're just out buying groceries thinking, I guess this is what I need to do. So. Yeah, no security yeah. protection. I believe that mass travel is going to be affected in the short term a lot. I was reading just yesterday about how, uh, buffets uh, can go back to normal because I wouldn't, I, I guess that none of us would be happy to be surrounded by hundreds of people at an all-inclusive buffet in the beautiful um, coast of Mexico, right? At least right. not in the short term. We will get there, but uh, there is going to be a lot of changes, a lot of precautions, mercer security, public transportation as well. It's, it's, it, we, we will be facing those. However, something that truly worries me is that um, we, the three of us, we live um, in the communication world. Right. Um, we know that obviously the U.S. Travel Association is estimating a drop around the 31 percent of, of our revenue um, and obviously sales, marketing, revenue. All of those are front line of every current future dollar of the company, right, of every company in the world. And unfortunately, we are seeing how companies are setting down their marketing budgets, right? And I get it, it's definitely non-essential operation, but they are cutting all marketing, even digital marketing. Um, and obviously we are seeing on the opposite side how people is turning into uh, social media, the internet to communicate because we no longer have that face-to-face -face interaction. So people is looking for information, is looking uh, for, for for dreaming, if you wish. Uh, what do you think about this approach? Do you think that the companies that are currently stopping marketing initiatives are the ones that will be most deeply impacted in the future, or will they be able to recover uh, as fast as they would hope? Yeah, um, in my perspective, I think right now the environment and where we're at requires uh, an incredible amount of understanding, right? And I understand if you don't have the capacity the financial capacity to have messaging in the marketplace. That's a thing that people just have to get their head wrapped around. It's I, if I'm making a determination on whether or not I can employ someone um, or I'm you know, putting budgets into digital channels, I would rather you go and you know, make sure someone has a job versus making sure that banner advertisement's online. Uh, does that mean I should do nothing? Absolutely not. I think right now is a great time to have conversations with customers. And so you are seeing that through digital channels. I think CRM, for example, is a really great um, place for you to connect with the folks that have been most loyal to you over the course of time. And so I do think it's important to engage customers, to let them know what's going on with your business. But at the same time, you know, we all have to have an understanding of this is just not normal. And you know, folks may not be able to do things that they were able to do three years ago, five years ago, or you know, looking back in history at any crisis, right? If you look at the modern travel industry, this is the most dramatic um, crisis we've had to face, period, right? And so, it's an unprecedented, unprecedented time, and I do think um, you know, expectations have to change, and understanding, um, most importantly, has to be on the the, the forefront of that. Um, so. I think it's it's really about what your capacity is and then making sure that um, the message that you have has the right tone of empathy uh, versus driving engagement with customers. Right. And for organizations um, like Google, which certainly a lot of groups obviously, obviously rely on, um, if you cut all of your advertising on the platform, you are structurally penalized by the way the by the way the platform works, which is not a good not a good situation. Um, 
and also, I mean, a, a huge opportunity. There are major keywords for destinations and just terms that would normally, I, one example is working with someone, normally pay $24 to click for a, a particular term. It's 67 cents now, right? I mean, it just is, you look at some of these pages which would be filled with ads, right? You'd have them all over the place and it's empty. It's a, it's a ghost town from it. So from that perspective, it, it's smart to continue your advertising with the one caveat is, do you have something to say that's relevant, right? And just saying, hey, we're doing a 50% off, two for one, sweet upgrade, whatever it may be, um, may not be the right message. So, uh, no, but I think for, for or organizations that can start really focusing on uh, and be clever, particularly in social channels, to to focus on kind of the inspiration stage, there there are some groups who are doing fantastic things. There's one um, resort, very family oriented. They went back, as, as Brandon said, looking at CRM and said, hey, we're gonna have a photo contest, dress up at home like you're, you're on vacation here, right? And they're getting amazing input and they're engaging their, you know, their, their former customer base. Um, it's super creative. Really great stuff. Um, other ones are, are doing things in terms of um, food and beverage options and foodies. You know, here here are types of things that that we're doing for uh, you know making different recipes and sharing sharing items. Things that are relevant to to people now. How can they have fun? How can we take kind of what you're missing here? And and a lot of them are being very bold of saying like, don't come here, right? And just like, no, we want you to be safe. And when this is over, we're here ready for you and, and we're with you. I, people really want to know that that an organization has their back. And that isn't travel related. That's that's everything from your bank to your utility company to your doctor to, to everything in their life. So I think there's also going to be that focus where I, I think the memory of these consumers isn't just going to be, you know, who's giving me the best deal when we come out of this and having the biggest sale or or the cheapest thing but like who was out there really kind of engaged and and really trying to make the world you know make the world better doing great things i saw four seasons um people some cynical folks are going oh it was kind of a pr ploy let me tell you that the New York Four Seasons is not a cheap operation to run, and they're giving those rooms for free to, to medical professionals. And I think that was a huge statement where a lot of the industry goes, well, if they can do it, I guess we can. Um, and so that's, I think that has helped you know, tremendously. And that really was kind of the first domino that tipped um, in the industry because before that, um, and still lingering a little bit, there, there are hoteliers, unfortunately, are saying, Boy, we don't know if we want to want to have our hotels quarantine quarters or help these, you know, medical workers because what if people get sick and they're quarantined there and they die? We don't want people, we don't want the stigma of people dying in our hotel. I mean, that mindset is just you need to get out of the hotel business. You're in hospitality, <laughs> and that's supposed to be how do you help people? That is the definition of the uh, of the industry, and so yeah, it's it's going to be very very interesting. So I think the ones who weren't giving refunds things like that there have been a lot of complaints oh my gosh the otas gave everyone their money back and we had a contract well guess what <laughs> these are extraordinary times i know you wanted their money but you didn't wind up providing services and just stop and i think i think people remember that if you 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 know kept their 500 dollars and just said tough um why would you ever come back and and stay with them again um yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So, well, I, I like to think that the recovery isn't as far as of it seems, right? And um, though the recovery date may be uh, the the one million dollar question right now, uh, we do know that eventually we will survive this, right? Our industry is resilient. Um, what are the strategies that, in your opinion, companies should be taking towards recovery? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I I do think right now um, is a really good time to uh, arm up your digital war chest. Um, and so I do think we've talked a lot about digital transformation over the last several years right now because traffic is going to be at a considerably low standpoint, and we're seeing that already in the demand on our side. It's a great time to make sure you have 
you know, the right infrastructure in place to be able to drive the rebound. And so, um, you know, anyone, you know, kind of looking at how do I make sure that uh, my website's relevant, uh, effective and up to date, and I have great uh, customer communication channels, now's the time to do that. And so I do anticipate airlines to kind of go through the process of, of um, you know, building up software to make sure that websites are more interactive, more response driven going forward. I do imagine hotels will be doing the same. And so right now is a really great time to kind of sharpen the knife to make sure that you have all of those great tricks available for when customers come back online and demands um, uh, you know, kind of rebounding. At the same time, I think we, a lot of us have, have seen uh, you know, Arnie uh, Sorensen um, uh, video in which he did give a nod to the role of OTAs and intermediaries um, to help drive uh, recovery. And I do imagine you know, the idea of book direct may um, be muted for a certain amount of time and you know, really going to a sense and notion of just book anywhere because we want you guys to travel. Um, and so I do think there will be some you know, subtle changes around messaging um, and where the focus is. And it's really about how do we collectively as a travel industry um, bring back the confidence more broadly to travel. And at the same time, when the time is right, our own first party or direct channels are really ready um, for whatever's coming next um, in terms of digital transformation. And so that, I think that's the moment that we're in right now. It's, you know, how do I um, make sure that I have, um, you know, coals and all the right fires. And at the same time, I'm getting my house in order for whatever the next uh, stage is. And I, I have websites and properties that are interactive and I'm able to build on top of as um, uh, you know, digital capabilities continue to evolve and, and innovate. Yeah, no, well, there is that... definitely a lot of work to do right now, but uh, Brandon, do you think that we should focus that um, digitalization more towards Q3 or more towards the long-term 2021 establishing phases? What do you think that should be prioritized? Because obviously we wouldn't be able to do everything at once, right? What needs to be updated in, in, in which order? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the capabilities that are in place right now are good enough for right now. If you know, I'm a brand sitting on top of a website and I'm making decisions, it's really about how do I prepare for the future? Um, and I'd be spending a lot of time and energy making sure that I've got the right tool set to be viable in the future. Um, right now, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And, you know, the, the airline websites that worked yesterday will work today right for that same transaction um but there's never been a pause of this magnitude where folks are able to take a step back and say let me actually really um, prepare myself for the future and so if i'm a digital marketer i'm really investing in you know what the next five years look like not just 2020 at this point yeah no and it, it's interesting um there are still groups i mean there's one particular independent resort um group in florida i know of they're taking this opportunity to to probably retool um, their tech stack, right? They've been having problems between their revenue management system, their property management system, their channel manager, all these various, um, you know, their CRM system of, of really working properly and they're figuring out right now how can they afford to to maybe do it. So right now they're figuring out what the problem is, what should they do and depending on what the issue is then they'll figure out if they can afford to do it now or they do it later but they're doing all that um there's a um oh a, a digital marketing agency it's very interesting right now uh, groups don't have a lot of money right the, the cash is kind of you know everyone's kind of trying to hang on to that but there's a huge amount of talent available people are trying to keep their their staffs employed um there's a digital marketing agency that's out there working with their customers and they aren't charging them for some of the stuff because they're just trying to keep their staffs going, knowing this is important, let's keep them going. And you know, we'll figure out how you pay for this down the road, but let's just try to help you do the things we have. And and you know what? We've got time now to, to retool that part of the website that really needed to be done, but we never really could. Well, the resources are there. So let's not just go, well, you've got to pay 50% up front and do the like, let's get this stuff done and stick with us and go. And those are fantastic things. And again, I would guess those clients are going to stick with that agency and really appreciate that, you know, they're doing great work for them at a time when they, they really need it and were, and were able to. So um, there's another, actually, um, 
a small niche online um, agency, or I'm sorry, online website, kind of in the romance sector, uh, they're going to retool the whole thing, right? Uh, they're, they're very, very low volume compared to, they're going to do a lot of experimentation, a lot of A-B testing, things like that. Um, not expensive, um, very kind of low resource um, required, but they're going to try to figure out a lot of these things because again, if you're in, the, say, the honeymoon and that sort of space, they feel they may come back very rapidly because you have all these people who've gotten married. They want to go <laughs> on a honeymoon and go someplace uh, go someplace else so um yeah so their groups that are forward looking um are doing that and again i mentioned the ones who had the very low keywords they're figuring out how they can how they can get positioned on their destination and be kind of the lead player and not big extravagant ads but really just kind of have a present work that up and then work that foundation so when things do come back maybe they can get some you know preferred placement uh, you know when everybody's going nuts and all of a sudden it's you know 10 15 times as much to to advertise on a lot of these platforms so yeah it, very interesting strategies from the folks who are who are indeed looking forward Robert, you gave us a lot of great uh, data about hotels in New York, the cruise lines, the airlines. I, I wonder because we are facing such a digitalization now um, do you think that we will be uh, having new digital experiences within travel in, uh, tomorrow? Uh, do you think that there will be new opportunities for the travel sector ahead to digitalize even more on the on the customer experience? I think so. Um, I think a lot, boy, I think all aspects of it are going to wind up changing. I think there's going to be a, a pretty big shift change. Oh, just quickly, Brandon, I think has to leave. I think he said- Yes, I was just yeah. I was just checking that. Uh, we are <laughs> right in time. So I am sorry for oh. keeping you a little bit longer, but thank you, Brandon, so much for joining me. Thank you, Robert. It's been a real pleasure. Right. And I hope that we have the chance to reconnect anytime soon. Thanks, guys. Very good. Lovely chatting. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.